Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Together, let us pray for the church universal, the church's leaders, its members, and the mission of sharing the gospel to all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And together, let us pray for the communion of saints. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And let us pray together, lifting one voice to heaven saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time for us to give our tithes and our offerings. And one of the things that we need to know as a church body, as we are focusing on prayer today, and we are focusing on those things, is that you can submit in that offering plate your gifts, your talents, your time offering, giving our tithes and offering is more than just about giving your treasures. It is about giving as a sacrifice to God the things in which God has given you to be a blessing to share the gospel through prayer, through action, through talent, and through treasure. If our ushers will receive.
problem that I need y'all to help me with. Do you know what this is? It's a phone. But every time I pick it up and I try to call somebody, I can't seem to, there's nothing. Do you hear anything? There's nothing. Do you, well, I, I don't, what am I missing? Battery. It's a landline. It needs a special cord that goes to the wall. And y'all just dated all of the grown-ups in the sanctuary. It needs a special cord, right? Okay, I don't have the special cord. So my next plan is to use my cell phone, but I have a problem. It won't turn on. Why won't it turn on? And I don't have a charger. So I don't have any way to call and talk to my friends because I don't have a charger to charge this phone. And I don't have the special cord that goes into the wall so I can talk to people using that phone. Now, I have a really big question for you. Do we need a special cord that goes into the wall or a charger to charge our battery when we talk to God? No. No, we don't have to have anything special. We don't have to have a cord. We don't have to have a charger. We don't have to have anything. Just ourselves. And there are many ways we can talk to God. And that's called prayer, right? We can talk to God out loud. We can talk to God in our heads. Can we talk to Him at night? Yes. Can we talk to Him in the morning? Yes. Can we talk to Him when we're eating supper? Yes. What about lunch? Yes. What about if we're taking a nap? Oh, wait, I got to go. What about if we're supposed to be taking a nap and we're not taking a nap? Yes. That's a great time. We can talk to God at any time. And do you know what? God will always listen. He may not give us the answer that we really think we need or want, but he's always going to listen. And that's important because God helps us when we pray. He helps us make some really big decisions. And he shows us ways that we can help others. Okay? Now, what we're going to do is we are going to say our prayer that we've been practicing over the summer. And then, well, I'm going to say it and you're going to repeat it. So that'll be helpful. When we're done, if you are three, four, five kindergarten, not Pastor B., you're going to get to go with me to children's church. If you're older than that, you get to go sit back with your grown-ups like Pastor B has to do. So, but right now, let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes, okay? And we're going to repeat after Miss Meg, and we're going to ask the grown-ups to say it with us, okay? Dear God, Dear God bless us as we learn and play. Bless us as we learn and play. And be with us each and every day. And be with us each and every day. Amen. Amen. Sit tight for a second. Congregation, I want to invite you to stand and join us in our hymn of preparation found on, one, on 452, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. 452.
Our scripture this morning comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Listen now for a reading of God's Word. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God and all creation. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious God, in and of myself, I am unable to do what you call me to do, and that is to share your word with your people. I pray, O oh God, that the words that come forth from my mouth are words that are formed by you, that whatever is spoken that you would take it and anoint it by the power of the Holy Spirit in such a way that we might be challenged where we need to be challenged, convicted where we need to be convicted, encouraged, O oh God, where we need to be encouraged. Our prayer is that we leave this place differently than the way that we came in because we have been in the presence of you, Almighty God. So speak now, O oh Lord, for your servants are listening. And all of God's followers said, Amen. Well, good morning, church. My name is Reagan Miskelly. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I am uh, one of the new pastors on staff. It is a joy to be with you this morning. We are also blessed with the presence of our district superintendent. We have Fred Britton with us. If we could show him a warm welcome as well as his wife. So glad, so glad. We had the bishop last week, Fred this week. We don't know who's coming next week, but we're ready for you, all right? There is a Christian comedian, and his name is Michael Jr. And Michael shares about the first time that he went to a new church. He had just become a new Christian. And so uh, as he walked into worship, he sat down, he sang the songs much like we did. The, sermon pre uh, the pastor preached the sermon, and then the pastor said to the congregation, Now I'm going to have you pray with your neighbor. Now, Michael Jr. confesses, again, his first time in church, he said, my neighbor doesn't go to this church. He said, now, if you want me to call him on the phone and pray with him, that's just creepy. And then the pastor began to explain, no, 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 your neighbor is the person that is sitting next to you. And then there was a new fear of God that he felt in his bones because he thought, first off, I didn't know that you're even supposed to pray out loud. And when it comes to this woman, I don't know this woman. I mean, what am I going to pray for about this woman? And just as he's feeling all of this anxiety and emotion, she starts to pray first. And he confesses, as soon as she opens her mouth, she had to have been the little sister of John the Baptist or something. Because she began by saying, Dear Heavenly Father, you said in your word in the seventh chapter of the 31st verse of the book of Matthew, the 61st word on page 200, 400, 1248, Lord, you said seek. S is for search. E is for everywhere. E is for excellence. K is for kingdom. And then she continued, you are Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. You are Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha. And he's thinking, man, she even knows his nicknames. <laughs> and now it's his turn to pray. And he is a competitive spirit. And again, he's brand new to this thing called Christianity. He doesn't have this spiritual vocabulary, but he was certain that he was not going to let her out pray him. And so he says, first of all, God, you, you are good. You are good right down to the last drop, Lord. Because, Lord, uh, I have to obey my thirst. Because one thing I know is that choosy moms choose Jesus. As the rocket's red glare, Lord, it gave proof to the night. Lord, I believe I can fly. Amen. Have any of you ever been intimidated by prayer? If you are like most of us, the answer is yes. 
This morning, we are continuing with our sermon series that we kicked off last week, where we are being challenged to dare to dream God's dream. What would it look like if we began to be audacious in our prayers, daring to dream God's dream for our community of faith and for our community beyond these walls? We talked about in order to dare to dream God's dream, there must be three things that occur. The first is that there must be some intentional discernment, that we must be individuals that come to God with a sense of humility in prayer, seeking the very heart of our Heavenly Father. Because if we are daring to dream God's dream, then we've got to know the heart of God and His longings for us as a congregation. Not only are we to discern, but we're to take a movement towards discipleship, to return to our first love, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world with the full realization that the deepening of our soul, the cultivation of God's work from the inside out is absolutely paramount for us to be able to dare to dream God's dream. The third movement is that once we discern through prayer what it is that God is inviting us to, once we secure our faith in relationship with Christ and regarding our discipleship, then we step out together, both hand and heart, one together, unified by God's grace and God's spirit. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to take a deep dive into each of these areas. And so this morning, we are going to examine prayer. Prayer, in its simplest form, is merely a conversation with God. Now, some of you may be familiar and remember a marketing campaign that happened years ago. It was a wireless phone service. And what would happen is that these commercials, a gentleman would pop up, for example, out of the sewer, and he would say, can you hear me now? He'd show up in the North Pole. Can you hear me now? You remember these? He'd show up also in the swamps, deep in the swamps. Can you hear me now? It was this idea that tapped into the emotion that you and I have of the desire to not only hear, but to be heard. Now, if you have talked on a wireless phone before, you've probably had it happen to you where you're listening to a loved one, they're sharing with you their story, they're getting right deep into the heart of the matter in the moment, and then all of a sudden, click, phone call dropped. Then there's another one that you may be on a sales call. By golly, you've been working it, you've been cultivating this business, you're hitting your points, you're hitting your stride, you're about to seal the deal, close this call, when all of a sudden, you're cut off. How do you respond? Are you angry? Are you furious? Do you say choice words? Do you want to throw your phone out the window? Again, God wired us in such a way that there is something within us that has an innate need not only to hear, but to be heard. How does this relate to prayer? When we talk about conversation with God, if some of us are honest this morning, we have been disconnected from our Heavenly Father for many years. In fact, some of us get far, far some of us far show so far more concern about us dropping a call in conversation with our friends than we show concern of our disconnection with our God. The truth is that when it comes to prayer, it is the ultimate wireless connection. And it is a call that will never be dropped. This morning, I'm going to walk us through, we're going to take a speed class through the Bible where we look at the nature of relationship with God, God with humanity, humanity with God, and how that relationship has evolved over the years. We begin in Genesis, and we remember a very intimate, personal, and relational God. 
God takes the very substance of the earth. He forms it as clay in his hands. He molds, he shapes, he forms, he fashions. And then when he has Adam and Eve just the way that he wants him, he takes the very substance of his being, his breath. In Hebrew, this is called ruach. And he breathes from his lungs breath to animate all of humanity in that moment. In this moment throughout Scripture, we see that God is pursuing and delighting in God's creation. He creates something and he says, oh, it is good. He creates Adam and Eve and he says, not only is it good, but it's what? Very good. We see in Scripture that God actually walks in the cool of the day, pursuing, engaging in relationship with that which he has created. God is intimate. God is personal, God is highly relational, and then comes the fall. Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, choosing their way, believing that their ways are higher than God's ways. And when that occurs, it severs relationship with God, with humanity, and with creation. And we fast forward. There was an understanding in the ancient days of cosmology. And so there was an idea that the world was a dome and that God existed on top of the dome. Underneath, humanity lived, survived, thrived. There was an idea that there were windows up in heaven in the top of this dome and that occasionally God would make God's self known. He'd open the windows, he'd cause rain to occur, he'd open the windows, he'd have lightning and thunder. But in regards to relationship with God here, God was distant. There was a great chasm that existed between God with that of God's creation. Now, we fast forward and we see a far cry from the intimacy that was held in Genesis between God and God's creation to this distant chasm with God on top of the dome. We move forward and we see that God engaged in selective relationship with God's people. We call this period in history the priestly reign. We specifically see that God takes a selective relationship with his servant Moses. Moses will ascend and climb up to the top of Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. He'll spend time basking in the presence of God. We read in Scripture that when Moses descends the mountain, his face is literally aglow with the radiance and the glory of God. Now, we don't know if God intended it this way, but when the Israelites saw Moses' face, it terrified them. When they saw the glory that literally was radiating from Moses, they asked that he cover his face when he is in their presence. And so Moses would cover his face. When he would climb back up to the mountain, he would unveil and take off his face, face covering again to bask in God's glory. Now, what happened is Moses served as a priestly mediator between the people. He would be the one that climbs up to the mountain, receives the word from God. He descends the mountain, and he shares the word of God for those, the people of God. Now, if we fast forward, one time a year, there was a day in the Jewish calendar known as the day of Yom Kippur. It was the day of atonement. And in the temple, there was a curtain. And our, 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 the temple was designed very similar to how many of our sanctuaries are, where the congregation would gather outside, uh, and then there would be a curtain temple. And the idea is that behind the curtain temple, there was the Holy of Holies. This was the place in which God's presence was felt to uh, be there at work. And so one time a year, a priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, and he would make a sacrifice on behalf of the entire congregation to atone for their sins. They would wrap a rope around his ankle as he entered into the Holy of Holies just in case the priest entered into the presence of Almighty God and the presence was so awe-inspiring, so magnificent, so awesome that the priest died 
that no one else had to go in, but they could pull him out by the rope. Now, we find ourselves living between these two worlds. Then Jesus shows up. And when Jesus so shows up, he begins to take all of these relational constructs of God and humanity, and he flips them upside down. Because one thing that we hear is that when Jesus is baptized, there's some unique language that occurs. Do you remember that when Jesus comes up out of the water, the heavens open up? Remember this? The actual Greek word is schizo, a tearing, a rendering. The heavens open up, a dove descends. The voice of God is heard as saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. People would have taken note of this because all of a sudden this distant God makes God's self known. Not only makes God's self known by a rendering of the heavens, but of speaking God's proclamation of blessing over this one named Jesus. We are reminded in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus comes and serves as the second Adam. Just as Adam introduced sin and shame into the world, Jesus comes in order for that sin and for us to be set free from that sin and shame. We also hear in Hebrews that Jesus is mentioned and referred to as the high priest. Now, if you remember when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he breathes his last breath, all of a sudden there's an earthquake. And then we hear that the curtain temple is torn in two. Do you remember this scripture? It is the same Greek word schizo that is used when the heavens are rendered, when they are torn open. Now we have the curtain temple, the holy of holies. If you don't have the history or understanding of what the Holy of Holies meant, that only one day a year a priest would go behind these curtains in order to make a sacrifice and atonement of sin for the community, then we cannot grasp the significance of this moment. You see, when Jesus offers his life, when he hangs on the cross, when he tortured, died, what we find in this moment is there is a rendering of the Holy of Holies. In essence, saying no longer does only one person of selective relationship get access to God, but other words, everyone now has direct access. Everyone has the opportunity now to experience the power and the presence of God, to experience intimacy, not only to hear but to be heard. Everyone now can experience that life, that life abundantly of knowing the gift and the grace of not only who God is but what God invites us to be about. The problem is, is that most people get stuck somewhere in between. So if they were getting stuck in the Garden of Eden and they were experiencing this intimacy of relationship with God, if they were walking day in and day out in communion with God, that would be one thing. But most people get stuck somewhere over here because they believe that when it comes to their relationship with God, they feel that there's still this tremendous great chasm that exists, that God no longer is relational, that, that God's got his hands full with dealing with the world. Why in the world would God want to be intimately personal with me and my life? And so we continue to live life as if God is distance, as God is far, as God is on top of this dome making the world go round. Or we live ourselves in this priestly understanding of relationship, where again, a priest or a priestess goes up to the mountain during the week. They spend time with God, receiving a word from God. They come down the mountain, and on Sunday morning, they share that word. You see how that works? Now, nothing's wrong with that. But if your entire faith is based on a 20-minute sermon and a one-hour worship service on Sunday morning, then you are living your life as if Jesus never came. What we discover is that God came so that we can have a sense of intimacy with him. That it's no longer a priest or priestess. It is an invitation for you to know and to be known. And what's interesting is the disciples got to see this aspect of Jesus and his ministry up close and personal. 
Jesus had this way of going and being with the people, engaging in ministry, and then he would pull apart to go and be in prayer with his heavenly Father. What they discovered when they had Jesus all to themselves, they didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to raise Lazarus from the grave. Teach us, oh God, how we can multiply the loaves and fishes and feed the 5,000. When the disciples had a chance to learn from Jesus and had them all to themselves, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. What Jesus knew is that prayer not only establishes a continual relationship with God, Jesus knew that prayer maintains a relationship with God. And for us just to get perspective, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. If Jesus needed and engaged in that amount of prayer, how much more are we called to engage the gift of God in conversation? In our scripture this morning, Paul reminds us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul reminds us that when it comes to prayer, prayer is actually a response of obedience to the commands of God. God doesn't say, if you pray. God says, when you pray, when you pray for those who persecute you, when you pray in secret, when you pray for unity, when you pray to avoid temptation, our first engagement of prayer is this response for us to be obedient. Not only that, but we also discover that prayer refines our heart. This is where God does the secret work of the soul where we begin to become transformed from the inside out. As I begin to engage in prayer and pray for my enemies, all of a sudden I'm able to extend forgiveness that before I couldn't extend. All of a sudden when I clutched my possessions, I'm now all of a sudden able to be generous for the things that matter to God. God not only refines our heart, but prayer invites us into depth of relationship. Now, for some of you this day, today's going to be the beginning of you hearing the voice of God personally speaking to you. I don't know many of you very well, but as we get to spend time with one another, as I get to hear your story and know who you are and share in mission and ministry with you through the years, there will be a time where you can call me and simply by you saying, Reagan, I will be able to identify who you are by your voice. And the reason is, is because I've spent time with you, because we've been in relationship, we've shared with one another. Now, I can share with you or you could share with me about your friend. I may know your friend's story, their grandparents, their parents' name, what they did for a living. I may know their history, but if your friend ever picked up the phone and called me, I wouldn't recognize their voice at all because there was not an intimacy of relationship. For some of you this morning, we've been going to church so long that you've heard all about this friend named Jesus. And you can tell his story, and you know how he was born, you know how he died, you know how he resurrected. But the honest, if we're honest, God speaks into your life and longs to speak into your life, and you simply do not recognize it because of the lack of intimacy that's been shared. And so this morning, I invite all of us, church family, to begin to once again live the truth and the reality for which Jesus came so that you might know the abundance love of a God that longs to be intimate with you, so much so that he sent the gift of his very son so that you might know what life is like, not on your own, according to your own design or devices, but simply because you're in the presence led by God. God commands a saying, in everything you do, present your prayer and your petitions before God. May we begin this day connecting to God, realizing that when it comes to our connection, the connection is never dropped because it is the ultimate wireless connection between your heart and the heart of an all-loving God.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us join together in our prayer of confession that's printed in our bulletin. Heavenly Father, too many times we neglect prayer when we might benefit from it most. We choose worry over prayer. We clutch to our stresses and burdens. When Christ calls us to cast them at the foot of the cross, we choose control over prayer. We choose to try to do things our own way instead of asking for God's way and seeking to follow it. We choose fear over prayer. We choose false comfort in numbing addictions instead of true comfort on our knees. Father, forgive us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, pray for us. Lord, have mercy. Today, we recall and rejoice in repeating once again the words of life from 1 John chapter 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. People of God, receive this remembrance of your forgiveness. Glory to God. Amen. as we have talked about intimacy of relationship with God, perhaps some of you may not have taken that first step of accepting the gift of God's grace and in return, knowing that abundant life. We want you to know that the altar is open for those of you that would like to pray, for those of you that might like to take that step of faith, or if there are those of you that would like to join the church. We here at Galloway Memorial are not a perfect congregation in any means. But by golly, we are seeking to be in God's perfect love and to walk faithfully with our Heavenly Father. And we invite you to be a part of that journey. And so as we sing our closing hymn, I want to invite you all to stand with me and let us sing hymn number 492, Prayer is the Soul's Sincere Desire.
uh, I have my family here. So uh, we're glad that you have come to join with us this morning. Uh, this is McGuire, my daughter, my husband, Rocky, my son, Wright, and our therapy dog, Swayze. And so um, I want to ask you, will you all be loyal to this congregation of the United Methodist Church through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, will you? And congregation, I ask you, will you be faithful in helping them be faithful to the commitment that they just made? Will you? If so, say amen. amen. And on the back of your hymnal, you will see a reception of new members and a congregational response. And let us join together. We give thanks for all that God has already given you. And we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite them to uh, stay here. We do have this in the way. Um, but you will please extend a warm uh, hand of hospitality to them and greet them as you leave. Also, in leaving today, you will receive a Dare to Dream prayer guide where we are asking each of us as a members of our congregation to be reading the same scripture, praying, for our, praying each for our ministries in our church and asking, how are you inviting us to dare audacious dreams for our church and community? And so you'll receive that on your way out. Hear these words of grace. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May it be so, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> 